Good afternoon. This is Sarah with the Department of Medicaid. It is not quite three o'clock and we are still clearing out the waiting room. So we'll give it just a moment before we get started. It is 3.01 and the waiting room is cleared. I do not currently see any TAC members unless someone is logged in under a different name. If not, we will give it just a moment longer while a few more people trickle in. Good afternoon, Hello. Lisa. This, this is Aaron. How are you? Sir? Can you hear us? There you go. Oh, now I can. I just, yeah. Currently, you they are the only. Zoom just a little bit, you know, and it's, um, <laughs> you don't slide right into it like you used to. Let's see Current, who we got on. Currently, we have you. Oh. So if you'd like to give well, it a moment okay. longer, we can. Uh, yeah, let's um, let's give them. Uh, it's three actors. Kelly did mm -hmm. resend the invite just to make sure everyone had the correct. That's same what list. I see popping up in my email. Hmm. Nobody said anything about not making it today. I did not receive any emails from anyone. Yeah. Well, I hope this day's finding everybody well. It's actually very pretty outside here. Well, for what it's worth, Stuart with Wellcare and I'm doing well today. Good. Not Good. worth I'm a bunch, but I'm, I'm doing well. Oh, we've got Not such a nice turnout from you guys.
It's nice and not humid. So that's nice. It is nice, yeah. Well, I, I'm not able to do a minute approval. I've got to have a quorum for that. Um, if you'd like, Lisa, I can send off a quick email to the rest of the members if you want to um, start the meeting reviewing the agenda. And I can do that really quick okay. to see if we can get, get a quorum for you. Okay. All right. Thank you. So... Um, Welcome, everybody. Again, thank you for being here. I'm very appreciative of your time. Um, we can, we're not able to do approval of minutes, and I know Aaron, uh, Aaron uh, takes a role, so we'll just move on to old business. Um, reviewing the old data request from 2022, data on expen expanded billing in schools. It was distributed on 3-11-24. Um, any input on the old data request, guys? Let me look. I've got it tucked away here. Now, I don't have the 2022. I've got the 2023 information um, totals for that. Okay. Well, let's look at that. that let's look at that. Because okay. perhaps that's a, a typo in that request. So um, on our part. Uh, let me see here if I can share it. No, I can't share it. You want me to email it to you or just That'd go over it? Okay. Give me just a second here. And Nat, if you could email that to me and I'll share it with the whole tag, but I can make you a co-host if you need a screen share. Okay. And oh, who's that? that? I didn't get yeah. Oh, okay. So just let me know and I'll pop it up there. You should be good to go now. Okay. All right. Are you able to see it? Yes. Yes. yes okay. Perfect. Um, the way I broke it down was for expanded access and uh, no free care. Um, I understand while we have smaller numbers for expanded access, um, we had $120,136.43 and a uh, build quantity was $40,590. Um, <clears throat> then under uh, no free care, um, our numbers were a little bit higher. <laughs> substantially, uh, seven th $7,648,954.25. $7 and the bill quantity we had on that was $1,976,890. Uh, I know that we've been looking at uh, behavioral health and that stuff. Uh, and I noticed, you know, uh, some of the numbers have been coming up on those. So it looks like, you know, uh, it's starting to get implanted in the school so. And the ones that are blank, uh, as you can tell, uh, uh, not, nothing was built on those. I got you. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're quite welcome. All right. So reviewing our recommendation um, to the MAC, we did get a response from MAC. Um, for, first of all, before I go forward, are there any questions about this data that was just shared with us from the team? From the from the group, any comments? Okay, um, we did get um, our response from the MAC. It wasn't everything we'd hoped for. Um, let me, I can open it up. And one of the reasons we wanted to discuss it was because the, the team itself wanted to discuss it. But the recommendation, just to review. Uh, was a recommendation that CPMs or certified professional midwives be recognized as providers eligible for reimbursement for their services by Medicaid. 
given their licensure and regulations come from the Kentucky Board of Nursing. The DMS response, um, that they, the response makes several contentions that need to be addressed. DMS would like to note the following response in the letter. Um, there was an, uh, a reference to data from several resources um, have been examined. This data does not appear to include specific information on Kentucky Medicaid birthing population. Um, and it says Kentucky's birthing population has grown in, in recent years to about 30,000 births. Several characteristics of the current population served by CPMs in Kentucky may not be present with the other 30,000 or nearly 60% of Kentucky births. Um, it's, it's really a pretty detailed, I don't know if you all want me just to read. Can, can, Aaron, can we just share that with them so that they can see that? I have a feeling Dr. Thoreau might be interested in seeing this response in particular. I'm pulling it up as we speak. Give me just a moment. And for the record, okay. Eva has joined us. Oh, great. Hello, Eva. Hello. Sorry about that. I'm glad you're here. Okay, so before you, it disappeared. I've got Eva now. There it is. It's coming back. So in front of you, you have our response um, from uh, the MAC um, in regards to our request about certified midwives. And um, like I said, it was not exactly what we'd hoped for. Um, And this is the response. Instead of me reading everything to you. Oh, yeah, that's much easier. Thank you. And I apologize for the delay. Sometimes when I get multiple things open, my computer relaxes just a tad. Totally understand. So they're, they're basically um, disagreeing with some of our information we presented. Um, and um, as you can see in front of you, they're contradicting or um, coming back with different data. Um, but the bottom line is, uh, given these considerations and the questions that they continue to raise, DMS is not prepared to expand the practice of CPMs into the Medicaid program at this time. So I guess we have more work to do. But we're no quitters. We won't give up. <laughs> But I know Dr. Thoreau in, in particular um, probably would like to have a copy of that sent to her out of the group. She would be the most interested in that response, I think. So, Hi, this is Dr. Terrio. I, I have seen the letter. Thank you. Oh, okay. I wanted to make Thank sure. You know. you had, so <laughs> I always say your name wrong, too. I accept my apologies. For oh, that. that's okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, you know, it was it, disappointing but certainly not an indicator to give up. We'll just keep trying. Hi, Lisa, if I could. I'm, this is Lisa Lee. I'm the commissioner for the Department for Medicaid Services. I thought hi. I would, hi, how are you? I'm glad that, you're not, I'm glad that you're no quitter. I am really glad that no. you're no quitter. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to pop in here and talk a little bit about um, this. As you know, in the letter, we, we do make, uh, you know, some of our... Um, uh, reasons for not considering uh, CPMs into the Medicaid program at this time. I, you know, I'd also just like to add that you know we're not 
um, just always saying no. I think a lot of the uh, information in the letter uh, does, does outline some of our reasons for not pursuing it at this time. Mm -hmm. um, another reason is that we have very limited resources right now. Um, we just received about six final rules from CMS that we are going to have to implement around our home and community-based waivers, um, managed care, access to care, different payments. We're even going to have to change up our Medicaid Advisory Council, and we have a whole host of um, activities that we are going to have to implement within the next couple of years. Uh, we're also changing our um, our uh, Medicaid information system that processes our claims. We're going to a new system uh, in, in 2025. So we just have so much going on right now that while, while we have our reasons for saying no at this time outlined in the letter, we also have all of those um, priorities that are just taking place um, in front of some of our other policies that we want to do. But uh, mm -hmm. definitely, definitely you know, don't be a quitter. Uh, keep, keep bringing it back and we'll keep looking at it. Um, but but right now we do have a whole lot of priorities and um, it would be, even if it was something that we could do right now, it would be way down on our priority list, given that some of the final rules, some of the provisions, the reports that we have to submit to CMS, uh, as you know, CMS funds about 70 to 80 percent of the Medicaid program. And some of the provisions in the final rule have criteria that we have to abide by. And there's even a note that says um, that if we are in non-compliant with those final rules, that CMS is proposing to reduce future grant awards by the estimated amount of federal funds attributed to the state's administrative expenditures. So Given that, um, that's very important. We definitely want to make sure we're in compliance with everything uh, in the new rules and that we are good partners with CMS, but we also want to be good partners with our tax. Uh, even though we have to change our Medicaid Advisory Council up a little bit, I don't think it's going to have an impact on our technical advisory committees. So mm -hmm. that's that's good news uh, for the nursing mm -hmm. tax. So we, we right. do appreciate everything that you do um, for our members and we are here to be good partners. And, and while we just can't move forward right now, um, you know, it's definitely something we can we can explore again at some Revisit point in the future. future. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And um, you've got some daunting tasks ahead of you. I, I hear that very clearly. So thank you very, very much. Um, thank you. We can Please. go back to, oh, go ahead. I was just going to let you know that Jennifer is joining us. She's logging oh, in and April is not going to be able to join us today. Okay. Okay. Great. Sorry, guys. I was looking at the, I was using the old Zoom link, not the updated email. Yeah. I, I, I caught myself with that earlier. So, <laughs> so thank you for joining. So I think we'll back up on the agenda for just a moment because that's three of five are present. Um, and uh, approval of the ape, I mean, February minutes. Um, if we could just go ahead and knock that out, that would be great. I can make a motion. Jennifer, do you mind to turn your camera on briefly while we vote, please? You still there, Jennifer? She's logging back in. We may have lost her. Oh, okay. I'm back. I know, so, I know sometimes She's it's hard for you guys Here's to have me. your camera on. Thank you. Can you see me? She's I mobile. can't see myself. <laughs> I'm in the car. <laughs> yep. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And you are my first. And Eva? Are you still yeah. on? Yes, I'm here. I'll second it. Okay. Okay, great. So we'll uh, with that, we'll approve the minutes for the month of February. Thank you both for that. 
And then we'll go ahead and move on to our new business. Um, and the reports from the MCOs, pediatric be benefits for vision care and eyeglasses. So what have you all got for us on that? So on this with being under new business, can you make the request what you'd like to see from the MCOs presented under this topic? Sure, sure. Eva, did you have anything specific that you were looking for? Yeah, so um, what vision benefits each MCO provides for pediatric patients as far as uh, vision exams, eyeglasses, how many pairs of glasses, and then would like to hear from the MCOs what happens if a child um, exceeds the number of glasses that they, they have a benefit for. If the, any of the MCOs are on and would like okay. to speak briefly. Oh, sorry, Stuart. Yeah, I knew it'd be Stuart. Yeah. <laughs> I'm never shy about talking. <laughs> so Not a bad thing. Can't be accused of that. Uh, so, um, Stuart, on with well care, I guess I'll, I'll just jump right in. I've, I've got some, some summary. I don't have a presentation or anything. And I'll uh, read it off for you. Um, so... Uh, each child gets a routine comprehensive exam, one a year. They get a pair of eyeglasses or medically necessary contact lenses. They, you know, and also we can send this afterward to Aaron, I guess, so you can have it in writing. Um, foster children, if they need an additional routine exam or glasses, they can get it without any prior auth. Um, also, children, if they if lose or stolen glasses or contact lenses, can get extra ones or say have a prescription change, you know, because that could happen as well. They can get extra. Um, all the eyeglass lenses are impact resistant and scratch resistant. Also, photochromatic lenses are available if medically necessary. Um, and of course, then all you know, children get the full array of medical benefits, uh, you know, including anything related to eye care. Um, and also visual therapy um, by a specialist is covered as well if medically necessary. And like I say, I'll I'll send, I don't have this in a PowerPoint, but I can I can send this to uh, Aaron as well, seeing so have it in writing. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you. So, Stuart, just a question to make sure I heard you correctly. But it, I mean, you're sending it right. You're sending the page. So maybe my question is a moot question. But so if a child, so a child benefit is one pair of glasses. If they're lost or stolen, um, mm -hmm. they can get a replacement. But what if they break? Um, you know, I believe. Um, hey Stuart, this is Kim Gray yeah. with the Hi hey, there. Phoning a friend, Kim Gray with the visa. <laughs> Hi Eva, my name is Hello. Kim Gray. I'm a strategic client partner over at Avisus, and we uh, manage the vision benefits for uh, WellCare, Humana, and Aetna in the Kentucky market. And um, you are correct. Um, we do allow a replacement pair of glasses um, if they are lost, stolen, or broken. So my next dumb question, Kim, this is probably going to come to you. Okay. So, um, if a child has two pair of glasses in a year, get broken, what, what would they do? What, what would parents, um, I mean, is it just not an option to get more glasses or is there a process? Um, they could go through like a prior authorization process. Okay. okay. Thank you. And sure. I mean, and they just, do they call the number on the back of their card to do that? They do. 
Okay. And then would they, they'd have to get an order from it. Would the healthcare provider have to initiate any of that or yeah. would? The healthcare provider could initiate that by contacting a visas and requesting a prior authorization. Okay. okay. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Thank you, Kim. You're welcome. It's good to have a lifeline. Yes. <laughs> I definitely need it. I use mine all the time. <laughs> Is there anyone else that would like to speak? It's Stephanie with Anthem. I have a presentation. Um, Aaron, I don't know if um, you want to pull it up or if you want to make me a co-host and I can try to screen share. Oh, and just the... Uh, Sorry, it would not let me unmute myself here now, co-host. Okay. okay, thank you. Let me try to um, screen share. Okay, do you just, I'm sorry, do you just click on the screen or do you have to hold, you have to hit control and you hit it? the share button. It's at the bottom of my screen about the mid and then you select the screen you want to share and it should pop up. I think that's what I want to do here. Hold on. Okay, I'm hitting the screen one. Okay, can you guys see my screen too by chance? <laughs> Does it share down like a, a blank blue screen? Not yet for me, Stephanie. Okay. Hmm. I almost have it open, Stephanie. Give me just okay, a moment. Okay, sorry. I think that yeah, I'm hitting the share at the bottom, the green little icon. It shows, you know, I have I have dual monitors, but I'm picking screen one. Oh, wait a minute. Now it just I can see a blue outline now around my screen one. <laughs> um, can you guys see now the presentation by chance? Because it looks different to me now. I see a one and I see a blue outline around it. I don't see anything. Yeah, I have it open. Anything. Give me okay. just a moment. All right. Thank you. Sorry. Give me just a moment. I pause this. I'm going to have to close something for something else to open. It's okay. Oh, well, <laughs> sorry. I, I wasn't able to screen share. I don't, I don't know. We you completely get it. <laughs> yeah, we've all been there. Story of life. That's right. Okay, guys, Zoom is not wanting to play nice in the sandbox, so uh, give me just a second and I'll try again. I'm now getting an error, but I closed several things, email, see if maybe that helps. It's locked and it won't let me open it now, so... Uh, 
I will close the presentation and try again. If so, if maybe we want to come back to Stephanie in the interest of time, if another MCO might want to speak while I work on trying to get this open. Hi, this is Anna Page from Passport Health Plan. I do not have a lifeline today, so I will put something together um, for the, the TAC and send to you all. Is there someone in particular I need to send to? You can send it to me, Erin Vickers. Oh, yeah, okay. To okay. All right, thank you. Everybody. Hi, this is Megan Johnson with Aetna. I do have a, a small presentation if I can try to share my screen. Give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> I will try. You're welcome to try. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, look at there. Okay. Did it work? Yes, yeah. it did. Yeah, you were holding your head just right. <laughs> Perfect. Um, okay. Move on to our first slide. Um, our benefits are very similar. Avesis also uh, manages our vision benefit for our members. Um, they do provide comprehensive eye care services, include which includes that routine and medical vision services. Um, that includes detection, treatment, management of ocular and systemic conditions, um, and they can seek care from participating providers. Uh, children in Kentucky must get that eye exam before they start kindergarten. Um, they are eligible for the once a year with prescription. As Avesis hopped in and mentioned, they can get replacement if those are lost, stolen, or broken. And we also do have the option to cover those through our EPSDT benefit if needed. Um, we have uh, the same allowance of lenses and frames. Uh, elective contact lenses are not covered, but a medically necessary contact lens fitting is covered if the criteria are met. We do not offer an out-of-network benefit. Um, in, in terms of the health medical benefits, some of the conditions that would be included um, are listed here. You guys are probably familiar with these, corneal abrasions, conjunctivitis, glaucoma. This is not a comprehensive list. This is just an example of some of those conditions. And then I did pull some of the data for uh, 2023 and then the first part of 2024 just to set, to show you how many uh, have we have paid for in those time frames. So you'll see exams, frames, lenses, medical, and then other, and then a total. And then of course, our contact information uh, for Avesis for any things that might be needed. So I'll stop sharing. Very similar to Stuart. I appreciate him going first and, and teeing me up. <laughs> Thanks, you're Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Anyone else? Hi, this is Eltina with United. Um, I'm going to share my screen. You're now a co-host. Okay. All right, um, this is our um, benefit package for the um, eyeglasses. Um, uh, the exam every year, um, pretty much like what everybody else is saying, what we're covering, eyeglasses, single, bifocal, multifocal, for certain conditions here, um, other diagnosis, uh, prescription, correction, um, color the polycarbonate and scratch coatings are covered, tinted lenses, um, the phone is covered when medically necessary. Um, as a lens options, press on prism. Um, you check by eyeglass replacements, one pair every calendar year. When the eyeglasses are broken or lost during the calendar year, or the eyeglass prescription for the recipient is changed during the calendar year. Um, Cataphyte lenses are covered in lieu of eyeglasses when a medical condition prevents the use of eyeglasses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure.
If everyone can please make sure to email their presentations to Aaron Vickers, it would be appreciated. Is there anyone else? Lisa, I can tell you a couple MCOs reached out to me about the presentation and with it being under new business, I told them it would be requested. So that's why some of the MCOs did not come prepared with the MC with a presentation. So I just wanted to let Absolutely you know. Absolutely fine. And we can carry it over as well for those who wish to um, contribute at our next meeting now that they're more clear about what we wanted. So our apologies there. <clears throat> Thank you to the ones who presented. We appreciate that. Okay, with that, we can go ahead and move on. Um, under, let me see, I let mine close because your edge was open. So request for data from the Cabinet on School-Based Nursing Services in Kentucky, 2022 to 2023, including cost settlement funds. And I know that's a, a new business. So if that's a data request that needs to, that we could have at the next meeting, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what something that we'd like to review. Mm -hmm. Do you all need that to be any better defined for you? Is that sufficient? Yes, ma'am. And I apologize. I'm trying to pull the agenda back up, but Zoom doesn't want to be my friend today. It's so, okay. Believe me, it happens to all of us. Uh, we get it. It's been a, it's it's been a long week. We get it. <laughs> what, the, what we would like to have, uh, which is helpful with your data request, is if you can put it in writing. If there's certain codes in particular you want pulled, time frames, how you would like it broken down, is it by county, um, service type. So the more detailed you can be in your data request, the, the better data we can provide you. Okay. That completely makes sense. Okay, we can do and that. And I do request it in writing because you guys are the mm -hmm. subject experts and I am not, and I don't want to write something down wrong or misinterpret something. And, and so that's why I asked for it in writing. We respect okay. that. Yeah, that makes yep. sense. Okay, we can do that, right, Eva? Yep. Okay, okay. All right, wow, that was um, a pretty short agenda, actually. Um, do the MCOs have anything they would wish to share with us at this time? You know, I, I would just note, uh, Stuart, again, that a huge initiative for all of us is immunizations trying to improve immunizations. It's a, it's an all hands on deck. We're all doing it. So I guess just to remind anything at all that we can do, um, you know, it, it's, it, and we've seen, as we all know, I, I think spillover from COVID uh, misinformation and we're seeing it impact other immunizations for this hesitancy. And I know especially, especially I think younger uh, moms, we've definitely seen that reluctance and we're trying everything, um, and I know our, our marketing director has indicated this is like a huge challenge, you know, trying to figure out how to solve that puzzle, how to get the word out, how to motivate. Uh, and it's, you know, just in a way that resonates um, the need to get your child immunized. And like we say, we've seen it. I think what measles is, it, you know, is coming up now. We're seeing measles outbreaks. It's it just, you know, directly from that, I think. So I guess just a reminder that, you know, that's a huge push for all of us. So, Stuart, do you think that this is related to the surge of anti-vaccine mentality or just simple non-compliance? Or do we not have a grasp on that? It's, I mean, it's, I, you know, it's so closely tied to the phenomena of the, of the COVID vaccine. And I think that's kind of, you know, I believe that, I mean, I think that's the root of it. And just, you know, from us, I know, you know, case managers and others talking to parents, we know that, that they have a reluctance now for immunize, immunizing their children. And it just correlates, it just seems like it's too much of a close correlation to the mm -hmm. COVID. 
hesitancy. And I think that's kind of, you know, been the spark or whatever catalyst for this. Um, you know, just historically, I don't think it was such a problem that all of a sudden it has become that way. And again, just from, you know, you know, talking to, especially we, we've noticed that it's young parents. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it just seems I was like- I curious because that had always yeah. been an undercurrent and it did really increase with COVID and the, and the vaccine requirements and requests and I was just- Yeah, and, and, and I think, you know, those that who oppose vaccines in general, it, it's kind of given them more of a platform Yes, definitely. And yeah. And so that's getting whatever publicly, you know, it's giving them a public plat more and more of a public platform. Yeah. So Lisa, I can tell you just from data from Jefferson County. Um, yeah, for example, we've spent all today, I've been at a vaccine clinic at a school. That's what we've been doing. So um we've seen less with hesitancy and more with access. Um oh, okay. our nurse practitioners and nurses have given over 7,000 vaccines this year to about 2,700 students. And so today, just to give you an example, we're at a school with a high percent, with a hundred percent middle and high school students who are new to the country. And um, we vaccinated 18 children with nearly a hundred vaccines. They have no vaccines. And so some of the issue of what's going on around the state isn't just, we have several areas around the state that have a lot of immigrant and refugee families and they don't have any place to go. And when they're working labor jobs that are during the day, they can't take off work to go get their child immunized. They have lots of other children and, and they don't have transportation. There are lots of barriers. So the more VFC providers that are out there, um, that's part of our problem in Louisville is there's not a lot of people who will give vaccines to children um, with Medicaid. We had, when we started working on vaccination issues, there were um, about 20,000 students who were not, one of every five children in Jefferson County was not, the school age children was not current on their immunizations and 92% were children living in poverty and 64% were children of color. And what we have found is when we bring the vaccines to them, when we have school located vaccination clinics that people are much more likely to be engaged. So Stuart, I would tell you to engage, you know, just to pass along engagement of the MCOs with nurses in their community, not just school nurses, but public health nurses, Nurses mm -hmm. in all sorts of settings are great advocates for health for everybody. And then, you know, the education of mothers during uh, pregnancy um, in particular is a good time to start. Um, we spent, uh, just as an example from today, so we have 400 plus kids that aren't current on vaccines. Over half of those don't have any immunization records. And, um, we know that our Hispanic Latinx families will tend to return consents, whereas our families from Africa are very reluctant to return consent forms. And so those kinds of things from each local community would be helpful, helpful for the MCOs to know when trying to target their outreach. I think that's, hi, this is Dr. Terrio. I think that's a great point that, um, that we really need all hands on deck approach now to to vaccines, um, it, you know, VFC providers are, seems like there's getting to be fewer and fewer of them. And um, and and you're right, the, it's a barrier. Why would you bring, you know, lose work and, and lose school time to bring a kid to the pediatrician's office? So you need to have vaccines available at places other than, you know, a doctor's office. So, um, one good thing that happened um, recently is the Board of Pharmacy uh, passed a, a bill that decreased the, the age that kids can be immunized in the pharmacy in Kentucky to the age of five. And, oh. and so it's, you know, you're past those kindergarten shots, those baby shots, but, you know, you can do a flu, you can do a COVID, you can do HPV, for example, and um, hope and and pharmacies are open on the weekends and you know in the evenings. So hopefully, if we push that too as a, a more convenient place and and time to get your kids immunized, that will 
really pick up and, and we can really help, you know, get the kids covered with the shots that they need. Thank you for that. Good information. So thanks, Stuart, for bringing that up. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks again. <laughs> Anybody else have anything they'd like to share with the tag? Okay. All right. Oh, Eva, you or Jennifer have anything that you think we need to discuss? Not me. Jennifer? Sorry, it wasn't letting me unmute. I'm good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, um, we may just uh, call it an early meeting today, if that's all right with the group. Is there a to that? No? Mm -mm. Good. Okay, well, we'll go ahead. I'll move to adjourn then. And thank I'll you all very much for your time and your presentations. And we will get that data request better defined and out to the team. Okay? Everyone have a great evening. You, yeah, too. you too. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.